Welcome to the video for chapter 32. Today we're going to complete our discussion of applied electromagnetic field theory by discussing what happens if you have more than one antenna. How can you use an array of antennas to accomplish something that no one antenna could possibly accomplish? We're going to talk about what are the radiation patterns for antenna arrays that, that consist of two elements, or what we call phased arrays that have as many elements as you'd like, or binomial arrays that have as many elements as you would like. And we're going to learn how to calculate the directivity of an antenna array as well. Our last historical perspective is Jill Tarter. Um, she is a, 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 an American astronomer, an American scientist, who uses radio uh, antenna arrays to search for extraterrestrial life. She was the former director of the Center for SETI Research, and she was also the inspiration for the main character in the movie Contact. So let's talk a little bit about why do we need antenna arrays. Uh, we know enough about antennas now that we can uh, design our antenna to have a desirable radiation pattern. Uh, we can measure this by the half power beam width, the directivity, the gain, the effective area. The problem is that we just don't have a lot of knobs to turn. We don't have a lot of things to adjust. And as an engineer, we want to be able to adjust things to get, to get the design to, to meet our particular specifications. For example, for a finite dipole, we only have one thing that we can adjust, and that is the length of the dipole. We need more knobs to be able to turn. We need to be able to adjust more things, to be able to custom design the radiation pattern to be as, as, uh, as focused as we'd like or as isotropic as we would like. An antenna array then is a group of similar, really identical antennas that are spaced in a regular manner. So you could imagine, for example, you could have an array of antennas that would all be on a line uh, and they would all have the same spacing, or it could be a rectangular array. So they could, they could be on a rectangular grid. Uh, it turns out then that constructive and destructive interference of the radiation becomes essential to understanding how these arrays uh, are going to operate. So we're, we're going to talk a lot about constructive and destructive interference today. Uh, we can talk about the number of antennas. We can study the placement of the antennas, the amplitude of the signal applied to each antenna, and the phase of the signal that's applied to each antenna. Now we're going to really, as, as just a, a very broad introduction to the field of arrays of antennas, we're going to talk about just two of them, and that is phased arrays and binomial arrays. Uh, binomial arrays, that name is, is usually a bit, little bit disconcerting for students. We'll understand why they're called binomial arrays at the very end, but for now, think of them as amplitude arrays. So we have antenna arrays in which we're going to be adjusting the phase, and we have amplitude arrays in which we're going to be adjusting the amplitude. Uh, and so first of all, before we tackle either one of those, we're going to see what happens if we have the simplest case, which is just two identical antennas. So this is sometimes referred to as a two-element array, but it's really just two antennas. We have one antenna that's, that's transmitting uh, and another antenna that's transmitting, and we have a particular observation point. And at that observation point, it's possible that the signals could constructively interfere if they happen to be in phase, or they could destructively interfere if they happen to be out of phase. So we need to do the math to figure out whether or not those antennas are, whether those antennas are in phase or out of phase. And you can see here that we've identified the path length R1 is the path length from the first antenna to the, to the observation point, and R2 is the path length from the second antenna to the observation point. Now we've also identified a middle path here, R, and uh, an angle of that middle path, theta. You don't really need to spend too much time thinking about those, because the very first thing we're about to do is we're going to put this observation point into the far field. And as soon as that observation point goes into the far field, then the two lines that are pointing out to that observation point from the two antennas become approximately parallel. So we're going to be able to see that they, they are approximately parallel because the thing they're pointing to is so far away. Uh, and that means that these two, these two angles, theta, are going to be approximately equal to each other. Now we can furthermore uh, put in an, a, a right triangle. So I'm adding an extra line here, and that's this line right here, which is perpendicular to path length R1. So you can see that that forms a right angle, which means that this is a right triangle. We can then uh, use the adjacent side is going to be the cosine of theta. So that means that this path length right here is going to be d cosine of theta. And if you look at what's happening, the difference between R1 and R2 is d cosine of theta. Because if I were to eliminate that portion of R1, then R1 and R2 would be identical. They're, they're starting uh, parallel to each other, and they're pointing to the same point, and it's going to have the same length. So it turns out that the difference in path length between R1 and R2 is d cosine of theta. It's a really nice little trick that allows us to figure out what is the difference between those two path lengths. Now, uh, the path length difference, d cosine of theta, is, is then multiplied by k. k 
k is the wave number, and it talks about how quickly does the phase change uh, with distance. So k times d cosine of theta is going to be the phase difference uh, between the two signals when they arrive at the observation point. Uh, and now, it's also possible that we could introduce a signal to the first antenna and then wait just a little bit before we introduce that same signal to the second antenna. That would be an intentional phase difference. And if there's an intentional phase difference, then we have to include that in psi. And we're going to use a lowercase delta to represent the intentional phase difference. So there we have the phase difference is delta. So kd cosine theta, that's coming from the geometry of the system. But the lowercase delta, that is, that is human intervention. That is, the engineer has designed the system to have an intentional phase difference. You might say, why would we do that? I promise, before we're done, you'll understand why we would do that. Now, we're going to arbitrarily say that the signal from one antenna has a phase angle of plus psi over 2, while the other one has an antenna has a phase angle of negative psi over 2. You know, all we really know is that they are, they, are, they are psi apart from each other. We could say that one was at 0 and the other one was at positive psi. We could say one was at 0 and the other one was at negative psi. We're going to choose it to be symmetric simply because it makes the math work out more easily. Now, that, that decision has no impact on the final answer other than an overall phase factor, but it is going to make our math considerably easier. So let's see here. We have, we have the total electric field that's being received is a combination, it's superposition of the antenna, first antenna's uh, electric field and the second antenna's electric field. And we know that the phase difference, e to the j psi over 2 and e to the minus j psi over 2, that's coming from a combination of the geometry, kd cosine of theta, and an intentional phase difference, lowercase delta. So we can, uh, if we assume that the two antennas are identical, we can factor out E1 out of both of those two antennas. And we could multiply, uh, multiply and divide by 2. And then we see that the thing that's in parentheses is actually cosine of psi over 2. So what we end up with here is an expression that represents uh, the, the, the total overall expression is 2 e sub 1 of r times the cosine of psi over 2, but we know that psi is just equal to kd cosine theta plus delta. We just showed that earlier. So we end up with an expression here, which is the, the original, the equation for one antenna multiplied by something that is sort of a combination of what's happening due to the array. And, and you might remember from an, our earlier discussion of the finite dipole, we saw what we, we didn't have a name for it then, but it is called the pattern multiplication rule. The pattern multiplication rule says that the radiation pattern due to an array is some term that represents a single antenna multiplied by another term that represents the array factor. So we have the element factor and we have the array factor. Well, it's pretty easy to see from equation 32.7. This right here is the element factor, that's F1, and 2 cosine of KD cosine theta plus delta over 2, that's the array factor. So just by looking at equation 32.7 and pattern matching with equation 32.8, uh-oh, I have two 32.8s. I'll call this 32.8 and a half. Um, we can see that we have, we have an equation for the array factor. Now, typically, we normalize the radiation pattern to remove any constants, so we're not usually going to include that 2 out in front. We just care about the shape. We don't really care about the fact that, that there's an extra constant out there. So the array factor for a two-element uh, array of antennas uh, is cosine kd cosine theta plus delta over 2. So if you had isotropic antennas, infinitesimal dipoles, if you had small loop antennas, finite dipoles, whatever it is, you would take that element factor, you would multiply it by this array factor, and that would tell you what happens when you have two antennas. So let's, let's consider an example here. We're going to, uh, we're going to look at what happens if there's a, a pair of isotropic antennas with no applied phase difference. So we know that f of theta which is technically f of theta comma phi, but there is no phi dependence uh, in this entire lesson, so I'm going to leave the phi out. So f of theta is equal to f sub 1 of theta multiplied by f sub a of theta. Now we know because these are isotropic, that means that f sub 1 of theta 
is just equal to one. It's the same in all directions. Isotropic means the same in all directions. So this is equal to one times the array factor, and the array factor is for a pair of antennas. So it's the equation that we just derived up here. So I'm just gonna copy that. It's cosine of kd cosine theta plus delta divided by two. But we're told that there is no applied phase difference, so this plus delta term is gonna go away. So f of theta is pretty easy. It's just cosine of kd cosine theta divided by two. So we start with two antennas that are isotropic, just as boring as they can possibly be, no variation in any direction, and yet just because we have two of them, we now end up with a, with a, a factor that is gonna be able to give us some really interesting behavior. Here's what that looks like. The radiation pattern for a two element array of isotropic antennas, which we just derived, uh, gives very interesting behavior as the distance D increases. As, so we've got an antenna and we have another antenna and the distance between those antennas is D. And so we have an equation for this and I've used MATLAB to plot this. Uh, the, the figure uh, shows, uh, shows a separation of D equals 10 centimeters uh, for a one and a half gigahertz wave. So the, as soon as I say it's a one and a half gigahertz wave, that specifies what K is. Well, it, it specifies what lambda is, and from lambda we can find K. So we know K, so we know K, we know D, uh, theta varies from zero to two pi, two is a constant. We know everything. So we know enough to be able to uh, plot this in, in MATLAB, and that's what this figure does. Now, this, while this figure does show it for D equals 10 centimeters, uh, there's also a variability here. And so I want you to be able to see what happens between zero and 50 centimeters. So zero would mean the two antennas are directly on top of each other. I don't even know how to draw that, but the two antennas are literally uh, directly on top of each other, not physically possible, but mathematically possible. Essentially, that just becomes an antenna that is twice as strong. Uh, and then if we space it all the way out to 50 centimeters, so it's, it's quite a long range. And if you click on that image, you'll be able to see that animation. I'll show that animation now. So in this animation, we're going to see what happens when we have two isotropic antennas, that is to say antennas that have the same uh, intensity in all directions, as shown by this circle here. Uh, if we take those two antennas and we put them into a phased array, and we slowly separate them further and further apart. So we're going to start with a, a separation of zero centimeters, which means that it's essentially just going to be two isotropic antennas directly on top of each other, and then we're going to slowly pull them apart, and we're going to see what happens to the radiation pattern. So you can see that when we start the animation, the radiation pattern is circular, and then it starts to narrow down, becomes an egg shape, continues to narrow down. Now it becomes clearly two lobes, looks like a figure eight. Now here come the side lobes. The two side lobes are coming out, becomes uh, uh, equivalent to the, to the original lobes. Now it's like the two side lobes are going to inflate like a balloon, but now they're going to split into two separate side lobes. And I don't know that it's fair to call them side lobes anymore. There are kind of six equivalent lobes. By the time we get the separation out to 30 centimeters, we've essentially got six lobes, all of which are coming out from the same point. Okay, so now you've seen how that, that uh, radiation pattern varies uh, as we separate the antennas further and further apart. Uh, let's then look a little bit further at what happens if we have more than two antennas. So this analysis was just for two antennas. We were able to find the array factor for two antennas. Let's look at what happens if we go to more than two antennas. This is what's known as a phased array. A phased array is simply a linear array of antennas, all equally spaced at a distance d. So you'll remember before we had two antennas that were a distance d apart. Well, now we're just gonna have more than two, and they're all going to be a distance d apart from each other. And I think that picture's on the next page, but I just want you to know what we're talking about here. Sometimes the phase is also the same. Uh, we, we send the same amplitude to every single antenna. Sometimes the phase is also identical, but sometimes we're gonna introduce an intentional phase difference, just as we did up above. Essentially, we're generalizing the two element array to more than two elements. So here you can see a picture of what that looks like. I've shown this with six elements. Uh, and so I've got, I've got six different Rs and I've also got six different thetas. But what's the very first thing I'm about to do? I'm going to, I'm going to put the observation point in the far field.
And as soon as the observation point goes in the far field, those six arrows all become parallel to each other. Those six vectors pointing to the observation point all become parallel to each other. So we have the same theta for each one of them. Now, if we just, if we just focus our attention on, on the two on the far left here, this becomes the same picture that we had before, where uh, this path, which I, I'll call this R6, R6 is d cosine theta longer than R5. But R5 is itself d cosine theta longer than R4. And R4 is r cosine th theta longer than R3. R3 is d cosine theta longer than R2. And R2 is d cosine theta longer than R1. So we have six paths, and by applying our d cosine theta trick from the, from the two element array, we're able to see that those six paths each vary or each differ by d cosine theta. Now, if I were to compare r6 to r4, it's different by 2 d cosine theta. And if I were to compare, say, r5 to r1, then it's off by 1, 2, 3, 4 d cosine of theta. But we're not going to do that. We're just going to, I just want I just want to illustrate to you, I want to point out to you that we're talking about a cumulative difference here. It's just that each one is d cosine theta longer or shorter than its neighbor. So there is the possibility, once again, that we will intentionally introduce a, a phase shift delta. So the phase shift at the observation point of each antenna compared to the one to its right is the same as it was for the two element array. If I just take any two of these elements that are adjacent to each other, the phase difference is kd cosine theta plus delta. Now we're going to get a little bit more complicated here because it's a, it's a series. So we know, we, let's, let's consider that this would be the one that's on the far right. So this is the rightmost antenna, and it has no phase difference. It's, it's, we're just calling that E sub 1. But the leftmost antenna is this one over here. And you'll notice that this is the this is the second on from the right, this is the third from the right, fourth from the right, fifth from the light, right, and sixth from the light, from the right. And each one of them is adding an extra e to the j psi uh, component. So it's e to the j psi, e to the j2 psi, e to j3 psi, and so forth. So what we end up with here, and I've I've just shown this for six antennas, but of course it can be generalized to n antennas. So this was the case for n n equals six you can see that it only went up to j5. So it's only going to go up to e to the j n minus 1. But that's because the first one has no, has no phase to compare it to. So we end up with a series here. And this is a power series. And we can apply what mathematicians have shown us if we have a sum of q to the n uh, from 0 up to capital N minus 1, then it's equal to this expression right here. Well, for our purposes, q is equal to e to the j psi. And oh, that's written right there. Um, and so what we can do is we can plug uh, equation uh, the, the terms from equation 32.12 into the summation of equation 32.13, and we end up with equation 32.14. So we end up with a closed form expression for what was previously perhaps an, uh, an infinite uh, summation. OK, can we do any more here? If we consider only the magnitude of the electric field, then all of these e to the j terms are going to be simplified. And we end up with an expression that is sine of n psi over 2 divided by just sine of psi over 2. And so this, of course, is the, this is the element factor, f1. And this is the array factor, fa. So fa of theta is equal to sine of n psi over 2 divided by sine of psi over 2. And of course, what do we know for psi? Well, we know that psi is kd cosine theta plus delta. We can also determine, and you have to use L'Hopital's rule to do this, that the maximum value of this function occurs when psi equals 0. Uh, if psi equals 0, all the functions are going to arrive in phase. And this means that they're going to add constructively. If we wanted to achieve that goal, we would need to make sure that, that this, this term right here would need to go to 0. So if that's going to go to 0, and neither one of them can go. Uh, well, neither one of them uh, is naturally going to be equal to zero. It must mean that those two uh, terms are going to be equal and opposite of each other. So if we wanted to make it so that these six or n antennas are just going to add at a particular point, the only way that we would do that is we would introduce a phase difference that was equal and opposite to the phase difference that was being created by the geometry of the system. Now this is not 
often going to be done because it'll only really be valid at one or maybe two, depending on the symmetry, observation points. So this is more of just a mathematical sort of quirk than anything else, but it's still good to know that you can, in fact, introduce an explicit or an intentional phase difference that can balance out the phase difference due to the geometry. And in that case, then, it's just n times whatever the antenna is, whatever the, the uh, element factor is, it'll be just n times stronger than that. Okay, let's determine the radiation pattern for a phased array with two half wavelength electric dipoles separated by a distance of delta. So here's the picture. I've got a, a half wavelength dipole and then a certain distance away, I have another half wavelength dipole. And uh, I want to, and it's just, so there's only two. Um, so you might say, well, what if it's more than two? We're gonna do that next. But we're gonna keep the math as simple as we can for right now. Um, and they're separated by a distance D. Assume that the antennas are transmitting the signals with no intentional phase difference. So first of all, we need to find F sub one. And I'm gonna write kind of small here. F sub one of theta is equal to, and you'd have to go back and, and uh, look at the radiation pattern of a half wave dipole antenna. And if you do that, you're gonna find that it is cosine of K times L over two cosine theta minus cosine of K times L over two, all of this divided by sine of theta. Now we can plug in a few things that we happen to know here. Uh, this is cosine of, k is two pi divided by lambda, and L is lambda over two. Remember it's two half wavelength electric dipoles. So we know that L equals, L equals lambda over two. Uh, and then we also have another one half because there was the, the two right there and I really shouldn't have put that mark right there. It's just uh, the two that was in the denominator is still in the denominator. And then that's times the cosine of theta minus cosine of, same thing, two pi over lambda times lambda over two times one half. And then all of this is divided by sine of theta. Cancel the lambdas, cancel the two cancel the lambdas, cancel the two, and this is equal to the cosine of pi over two cosine of theta minus the cosine of pi over two, all of this divided by sine of theta. But what's the cosine of pi over two? It's just equal to zero. So that's just equal to zero. So this becomes the cosine of pi over two cosine of theta divided by the sine of theta. Don't need a parentheses there. So that's for a single antenna, but we knew how to do that. I mean, we were talking about this uh, two lessons ago. Uh, F sub A of theta, that's the array factor. We just found that to be sine of N psi over two, but I'm gonna say N is equal to two. So it's two psi over two, divided by uh, two times the sine of psi over two. Now uh, there's a the 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 there's a, a trig function, a trig identity. I'm going to pull the one half out in front here. I'm going to keep the sine of psi over two in the denominator, but sine of two psi over two can become uh, can become sine. Let's see, sine of two theta is equal to two times the sine of theta times the cosine of theta. So you can, you can look at how I did the manipulation of the numerator there, it's a double angle formula. Um, the sine of psi over two is now gonna cancel with the numerator and denominator, the two and the one half are gonna cancel, and I'm just left with cosine of psi over two. But that's equal to cosine of KD cosine theta plus delta divided by two which it turns out there is no delta because the antennas are transmitting with no phase difference. So this is just equal to cosine of KD cosine theta over two. And you might say, couldn't you use one of the tricks from like the first part of this to get rid of that KD? But the thing is that we don't really know the value of D. Uh, we knew the value of L, L was lambda over two. And so that made, us, uh, made it easier for us, but we don't know the value of D, it could be anything. So F of theta, is equal to F1 of theta times FA of theta. And that's equal to 
cosine of pi over 2 cosine theta divided by sine theta multiplied by cosine of kd cosine theta over 2. All of that is the total radiation pattern of two half-wave dipoles that are spaced a distance apart from each other. So again, notice that we know, we know K. We can find K from, from whatever the wavelength is that's being transmitted. Uh, D is the distance between the dipoles. That would, e that would e either be a variable or it would be given. Theta varies from 0 to 2 pi. Everything else here is a constant. So we can, uh, we can do this. Uh, we, can, we can plot that. Uh, I've plotted it for D equals lambda here. Of course, you could choose any value of D. Um, so I've also made it so that this is an animation that you can see with D varying between 0 and 3 lambda. So I'm going to go ahead and click on that animation so you can see it now. In this animation, we're going to start with a half-wave dipole antenna. We're actually going to start with two of them. Again, they're going to be directly on top of each other, but you'll notice that we are already starting, we are already starting with this figure 8 shape because that's the radiation pattern of a half-wave dipole. As we begin to pull them apart from each other, that radiation pattern is going to modify. We're going to find that it's, it's going to really optimize at about a half wavelength. It's going to become extremely focused and extremely directed. And then we're going to get a whole bunch of different side lobes coming in. So let's begin to uh, separate those out from each other. And as we separate them out, you can see that the, the lobes are going to narrow down. The directivity is really improving here. And everything's looking great. Then we get these side lobes. Now, we could probably uh, find a way to filter those side lobes out. And notice that the main lobes do continue to get narrower and narrower as we uh, continue to increase the separation. We've now got six lobes here, uh, two main lobes and, and four side lobes. Here come four more side lobes. So we're going to end up with quite a number of lobes here as we've, as we've continued to increase the separation now. We're at two and a half lambda separation. Uh, the original antennas were half wave dipole antennas. So we're just separating them further and further. And you can see that the radiation pattern gets to be quite complicated. Uh, we probably wouldn't go up to 3 lambda separation, but somewhere in the 0.5 to 0.75 lambda, we got really good behavior. Okay, so now we've seen what happens if we have two antennas. Let's go a step further. Um, uh, what happens if we have four antennas? So if n equals four, I'm not going to make you do the math, or I'm not going to do the math for you. Uh, but we will do it math. We will do it uh, 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 using the computer simulation. So here you can see this is a, this is a figure that shows for a half wavelength separation, d equals uh, lambda over 2. That's what this figure shows. But if you click on the image, now you can see an animation that shows as d goes from 0 up to 3 lambda. This time we're going to study a four element half wave dipole phased array. So we have four different antennas, each of them a half wave dipole. They're going to be spaced apart from each other. Uh, and we're going to increase that spacing as we move forward. So we're, we're going to start off with uh, all of them on top of each other, uh, but then we're going to space them out. There's no intentional phase difference that's, difference that's being introduced here. So let's see what happens when we begin to uh, do the, the increase the phase, or increase the spacing. Look at how narrow those main lobes are getting. And yes, there are some side lobes here, but we could probably filter those side lobes out. Look at those main lobes. Look how narrow they are. That's extremely desirable. Now that we just passed through about one lambda for the spacing, we probably wouldn't go any further than one lambda, but it's just interesting to see what happens if we space it out even further. You can get all of these very small, very narrow uh, side lobes, but then we do pick up essentially about one, two, three, four, five, about 10 main lobes as we come up on the spacing of three lambda. So we've now seen uh, we've seen a, a simple two-element array. We've seen a phased array with with uh, with two antennas. We've seen a phased array with four antennas. We've studied uh, both uh, if the antennas are isotropic or if they're half wavelength antennas. Uh, we've seen a lot of different things about phased arrays. But one thing that we haven't talked about yet is that intentional phase difference delta, that lowercase delta. Now that is maybe one of my favorite things because all of the other animations up until now have involved physically moving the, moving the antennas relative to each other. But in this one, as you're about to see this animation, you don't have to move the antennas at all. You're just going to be adjusting the phase difference between between the signals that are going to the two antennas. 
This time we're not going to change the spacing between the antennas. We're going to change the phase of the signals that are introduced to the antennas. We have a four element array and each of those elements is an isotropic antenna. So it has just a circular radiation pattern. We've placed those antennas a half wavelength apart from each other and they're not gonna move. They're gonna sit at their current location and if you were to look at those antennas, you would not know that anything was happening. But we're going to change the phase that is being introduced to the signals going to those four antennas. You can see that we're starting out with an, a, a, a radiation Radiation pattern that is that is largely horizontal and as we begin to increase the signal or as we begin to increase the phase notice the sweeping there's a sweeping across the top that's going counterclockwise and across the bottom that's going clockwise that could be very desirable we might want to do this sweeping action going from left to right notice by the way we just passed through the symmetric point which is when there is no phase difference and now we're sweeping all the way further to the left and so this radiation pattern is changing simply because of the change in the phase that we're introducing to each of the four signals. Okay, so now we've talked a lot about phased antennas. We've seen what happens when there are uh, intentional phase differences. We've talked about varying the distances between the antennas. Let's, let's transition to our other main type of antenna. We, we, we can now see uh, a lot of good things can happen with the phased arrays. In particular, we can change the direction that the antennas are pointing depending on the phase difference that we put between the, uh, between the antennas. That's, that's, I think, my favorite part about phased arrays. But let's talk a little bit about bi binomial arrays. Again, remember that a binomial array could also be called an amplitude array. Now, it's not called an amplitude array, so maybe I won't mark it out. I'll just put amplitude in parentheses here because nobody calls it an amplitude array other than me. Uh, they're called binomial arrays for a reason that is very good and that will become very clear in just a second. So the thing to know about a binomial array is that we're going to send it exactly the same signal at the same phase, uh, so same phase but different amplitudes. That's the most important thing to know about a binomial array. So let's consider in figure 32.9, here's a binomial array. We send uh, a certain voltage, a certain amplitude to the, to the outside antennas. We send double that, that voltage to the, in, to, the in, to the middle antenna. And they're spaced a distance of lambda over two apart from each other. So you might say, why in the world would you do that? Figure 32.10 shows why in the world we would do that. Because we can now think of the middle antenna as being like two antennas of the same amplitude that are just directly on top of each other. Now I've kind of separated them out in this, in this next picture to show them as being separated. But the reason for that is because now we can think of the antennas, the antenna on the left and half of the antenna in the middle as being a two element array and the antenna on the right and half of the antenna in the middle as being another two element array. The centers of those two arrays are now lambda over two apart and we can think of this as a pair of antenna pairs, a pair of pairs. And so what this does is this allows us to use what we've talked about with, uh, with phased arrays, but now we're gonna be doing it just with amplitude arrays with a very interesting and very desirable result. So let's talk about the, the, what actually happens when we have a pair of pair of antennas. Well, we know the array factor for a pair of antennas is sine of two psi over two divided by sine of psi over two. And using that double angle trick that we saw earlier, that's just equal to cosine of psi over two. Now we're not introducing a phase difference, so that psi is really just kd cosine of theta. So the array factor for, uh, for, an, for a pair of antennas receiving the same phase is just cosine kd cosine theta over two. But let's go a step further and say now both of those antennas are half wavelength. I'm sorry, that they are a half wavelength away from each other. So if d equals lambda over two, so we know that d equals lambda over two and k equals two pi over lambda, well now we can put those expressions in here. The lambdas are gonna cancel, uh, one of the twos are gonna cancel, and we're again left with cosine of pi cosine theta over two. So that's the array factor for a pair, but that's also the element factor because it's a pair of pairs. So the element is an array, I'm sorry, the element is a pair and the array is a pair. So that means that the element factor is equal to the array factor, and they're both equal to the cosine of pi cosine theta over two. And if I multiply those two together, I just get a cosine squared. So that's really nice because it's very clean. Uh, we, we see that if, if, we have, uh, if we have here n equals two, well, that just means that the, the total radiation factor, the total radiation pattern is just cosine squared pi cosine theta over two. So we have here a picture where we have the element factor 
and the array factor, and those are equal to each other. These are equal. And, and if you look at the pictures, they are identical to each other. But then the radiation pattern, I hope you'll notice, is narrower than either the element factor or the array factor. When we multiply the element factor by the array factor, we get the narrower radiation pattern of, of the entire array. Now notice that this, and I'm going to emphasize this again several times, this was originally for three antennas. I'm going to scroll back up so you can remember that the picture showed three antennas, right? Here you can see one, two, three antennas. And so, uh, but even in the very first uh, figure caption, I called it n equals two. So I just want to emphasize to you that n is always going to be one less than the number of antennas. There will always be one more antenna. There will be always, always n plus one antennas when we're going to be talking about an, uh, uh, an order n binomial array. We'll, we'll hit on that more later, but for now, I just want you to be aware of that. So then, of course, what's the natural question? Well, what if you went to four antennas? So if we go to four antennas, we need to have it be uh, one, three, three, one. They're still going to be lambda over two apart from each other. But now what we end up with is a pair of one, two, one arrays. You know, what we just talked about was a one, two, one array. Now we have a pair of those arrays. You could also think of this as a pair of a pair of pairs. Um, but I think a pair of one, two arrays, a one, two, one arrays is probably the, the easiest way to think about it. So we have an element factor, which is cosine squared, and we have an array factor, which is cosine. When we multiply those together, we get a total radiation pattern that's cosine cubed. And again, this is for n equals 3, which is to say 4 antennas. So now what I hope you notice is that the element factor is pretty narrow. That was actually the solution to our, to our n equals 2. So this is the total radiation pattern for n equals 2. The array factor is always just going to be cosine. So this is, this is cosine squared. This is cosine. And when we multiply them, we get cosine cubed. And so the, the radiation pattern on the far right is even narrower than the element factor on the far left. And both of them are narrower than the array factor in the middle. Again, just remember, there will always be n plus 1 antennas in a binomial array of order n. There's a really good chance that that's going to be on the final exam. So I just really want to emphasize it. Um, all of these problems are all going to be referring to n. n is always one less than the number of antennas. So the intensity of each of the n plus 1 elements can be calculated using a binomial distribution, which you saw, I'm sure, in your probability and statistics course. And that's why this is called a binomial array. So the, the, the element factor, I'm sorry, the, uh, the intensity of each one of the antennas is n factorial, where n is, the, n is the order, not the number of antennas, but the order of the binomial array, divided by k factorial, where k is the antenna number, which always starts at 0 and always goes up to n. And the, therefore, there are n plus 1 elements. Uh, furthermore, divided by n minus k, the quantity factorial. <clears throat> and the radiation pattern for an order n binomial array, one that has n plus 1 elements, is cosine to the nth of pi over 2 times cosine of theta. As n increases, the power of the cosine will increase. That makes the lobes narrower, and that increases the directivity of the radiation pattern. So what is the intensity for each element of a binomial array with n equals 4? And then what will be the radiation pattern for such an array? So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to calculate the intensity of each element. So I know that there, if n equals 4, I know, that, I know that there are going to be 5 antennas. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And I will just tell you that the math always works out so that the 2 on the outside are always going to be equal to 1. I'll prove that to you in a second, but you won't need to calculate the 2 on the outside. They are always equal to 1. So this is going to be uh, antenna number 0, antenna number 1, antenna number 2, antenna number 3, and antenna number 4. So let's see, what is I sub 0? I sub 0 is equal to, and let me just remind you that the equation we're using is equation 32.27. Uh, and we know that n is equal to 4, and in this case, k is equal to 0. So this is 4 factorial divided by 0 factorial times 4 minus 0 factorial. And that is equal to 1. Furthermore, uh, well, now I'll just do them in order. I1, then, is equal to 4 factorial divided by 1 factorial times 4 minus 3 factorial, which is to say 4 times 3 times 2 times 1 
divided by one times, whoops, oh, I made a mistake. That's not four minus three, that is four minus one. Sorry about that. Uh, so that's three factorial, which is three times two times one. Cancel the threes, cancel the twos, cancel the ones. Don't really matter when you cancel the ones. I sub one then is equal to four. I sub two. I sub two is equal to four factorial divided by um, two factorial times four minus two factorial, which is four times three times two times one divided by two times one times two times one. I guess I'll cancel both twos with the four to make my life a little bit easier, and I find that this is equal to six. So what I've already found is that this has an amplitude that is four times as large as the, as the outside ones. This one has an amplitude that is six. I'll just tell you that by symmetry, this, the third antenna better darn well have a four because this, the binomial array is always symmetric. So let's, let's see what I sub three is. I sub three is four factorial divided by uh, K, which is three factorial times four minus three factorial which is four times three times two times one divided by three times two times one times one factorial is just one. Cancel the threes, cancel the twos, cancel the ones, and I'm left with just four. And thankfully, the math did work out and that one is equal to four. Um, I'm sorry this is getting to be pretty sloppy how I've laid this out, but I sub four then is four factorial divided by k factorial times n minus k factorial, and that works out to be equal to one. And then the question was, what is the, uh, what is the radiation pattern? F of theta is cosine to the fourth power of pi over two cosine of theta. So I guess this would be one part of my answer, and this would be another part of my answer. And then the last thing we're going to talk about is the directivity of antenna arrays. Um, it turns out that if you have uh, an array that contains n identical elements, each of which has to be separated by a distance d equals lambda over 2, then you can calculate the directivity by doing the summation of the intensities and then squaring them, divided by the sum of the square of the intensities. So that's a subtle difference, but it's an important one. We're either adding and then squaring, or we're squaring and then adding. Let's look at what happens if we have uh, the directivity of a phased array with three antennas. Remember, a phased array always has the same amplitude. So I'm gonna say this is an amplitude of one on each of the three of them. That's not exclamation points. Those are antennas with amplitudes of one. So the directivity then is going to be one plus one plus one, the quantity squared, divided by one squared plus one squared plus one squared, which is nine over three which is 3.0. And then for the directivity of a binomial array, for a binomial array, I know that I have three antennas and I know that it's one, two, one. That's the first binomial array that we first studied. So the directivity now is one plus two plus one, the quantity squared, divided by one squared plus two squared plus one squared. This is four squared, which is 16, divided by one plus four plus one is six, and this is 2.67, 2.67. So if you were asked by your employer to uh, design an array that had maximum uh, directivity with three antennas, you would choose the phased array. You would choose the one that gets a directivity of 3.0. So then you would say, well, then why in the world does anyone ever use a binomial array? Well, here are the pictures. The one on the left is a, is a phased array, and the one on the right is a binomial array. These are exact comparisons of the two antennas that, of the two antenna arrays that we're talking about here. And as you can see, there is a drawback to the phased array, and that is these side lobes. The side lobes uh, could be problematic. Depending on what's going on here, you might be able to get rid of the side lobes, or you might have to keep the side lobes. Um, and if you did that, then, then the directivity might, might not be as good as it seemed. What you will notice is that, you know, if you do this comparison of the half, half, uh, power, uh, way, uh, half power bandwidth, I think 
yeah, I think what you're going to find then is the half power beam width, not half power bandwidth. The half power beam width of the phase rate is narrower than it is for the binomial array. I think that you can visibly see the difference there, but the trade-off is that, that over here you've got the side lobes, and over here it's just, uh, there are no side lobes, it is just a, a really pure uh, sort of hourglass shape, and you can make that hourglass shape be as narrow as you want it to be for a particular binomial array. So which one is better? As in almost all cases with engineering design, the answer is it depends. So we know that arrays of antennas give us a lot more flexibility to design radiation patterns because there are so many variables that we can adjust. The overall radiation pattern is always an element factor multiplied by an array factor. A two element array has an array factor that looks like this. Um, a phased array composed of a number of identical antennas spaced uniformly and with the same amplitude is going to have an array factor that looks like this. And then a, 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 a binomial or amplitude array consists of a number of identical antennas spaced uniformly receiving the same phase, but the amplitude will vary. And it will vary according to a binomial distribution. And then we end up with a radiation pattern that is cosine to the nth times pi over two cosine of theta. And then the directivity of an array of identical antennas can be found according to this equation.